Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time for joining us today. My name is Brenda Hemmelgarn, and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry. I'm really pleased to see such a strong attendance today. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the agenda and tell you a little bit about what we're trying to achieve here today. I started my role in January the 1st and had an opportunity to meet with some of you at various conversations with the Dean, um, at some meetings, at some department chair meetings, but then the pandemic struck. And since then, I feel like I've been in a bubble. So it's really been my pleasure to be able to reach out in this virtual world that we're now living in to be able to meet with you on a more um, informal basis so that we can stay informed. So the whole goal, the whole purpose of this, this session is to ensure that staff and faculty are well informed about the activities within the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry and to show how we're going to work together to carry out in particular a balanced budget and to begin a new strategic plan for our faculty and in particular how this will align with the institutional goals and activities that are taking place um, here at the University of Alberta. So the format will be a conversation. I'll speak for about the first 15 to 20 minutes and then we'll allow the opportunity for dialogue. The chat box will be disabled, but you can direct all your questions to the Q&A box. And that's actually located um, at the very bottom of the screen. So if you type your questions in there or upload your questions, uh, Daryl Silzer, who's here with me, will be able to uh, communicate those questions to me and we'll be able to answer them for you. I want you to note as well that this event is gonna be recorded as well. So let me begin, and let me begin by just saying thank you. A huge thank you to all of you for all of that you've done and all the pride for how the faculty has responded to the challenges of these past few months with the COVID pandemic. Our community has really stepped up early and you continue to be flexible and adaptive and a source of inspiration in so many ways. This pandemic has really changed the way that we work, the way that we teach, the way that we do research, and the way that we live. With respect to work, many of you have been working remotely, and, and we are encouraged to continue to do so for the next, the next while. I know this shift to working remotely has come with its own unique challenges, and I'm very impressed and so proud of how our community has worked together and supported each other despite being physically apart. Thank you to everyone who's working so hard from home, in many cases juggling childcare, juggling jobs, potentially juggling looking after sick ones and the stresses of this peculiar time. So thank you as well to those who are coming to our campus for your courage and dedication to continue the essential activities that are taking place here. Our teaching has also changed. Actually, within a matter of hours, our teaching changed back in March from being in-person to remote online delivery. And again, I really wanna thank all of you who adapted to making that remote delivery possible, both for completing the winter session as well as for the spring and summer session. And this will likely continue to build on um, as we proceed into planning for the fall session as well. And research has also been impacted. Our faculty, as you know, had the majority of their research put on pause and essential COVID-related and related activities were able to continue. But I've been really pleased this past week to see a transition now to ongoing research activities. Again, being careful and cautious in meeting the requirements of the university as well as the research office. As you know, proposals to recommence research will have to be approved by the research office and all teams returning to research will need to be especially aware of complying with COVID-19 protocols. It's still crucial that we follow all physical distancing, hygiene, and other requirements when working on campus. And I'd like to say a special thank you to Dr. Chris Powers and the Office of Research for all the work that they have done in handling these research requests. And to Dr. Maya Lang and Shirley Schiffer for all the work that they have done with respect to the teaching and ensuring that our educational activities continued, not just continued, but um, Excel during these, these past months. I want to take a minute just to tell you a little bit about um, the activities that took place as well during these past few months and all the meetings and decisions that, um, that had to take place. 
There was a lot of work that went on behind the scenes. There were decisions and discussions that had to be made and decisions made with, I must emphasize, broad consultation uh, at the institutional level, at the local level, at the provincial level, and nationally as well. And it was important that we had such broad consultation because some of the decisions made will affect our trainees, not just here at the University of Alberta, but other institutions as well. So to tell you a little bit about that, here at the University of Alberta, we had on a daily basis a dean's call with leadership. So 7.30 every morning, we had a conference call with senior leaders and deans. We now are meeting three times a week because there's slightly less decisions, but still a number of decisions that had to be made. Here in the faculty, we meet regularly, um, as does the various um, leadership teams within education and research. At a provincial level, we're regularly meeting with um, individuals from the University of Calgary, as well as with Alberta Health Services, especially with respect to clinical care. And importantly, we're also meeting regularly nationally. In fact, the um, Association of the Faculties of Medicine in Canada, the AFMC, and that's all the deans of the faculties of medicine across the country. We're meeting on a, a weekly basis initially. Now we've gone to every two weeks to discuss issues about education and research, again, that impact our trainees across the country. We wanted to make sure that the decisions being made were not going to disadvantage any of our trainees at any point in their training programs. So that's a little bit about um, all the decision making that was happening behind the scenes. And thank you for your patience and flexibility. There were lots of things that were made um, in, in quick succession, um, but decisions that had to be made to, or to continue to ensure, first and foremost, that our faculty, students, and staff were safe and that we were able to continue as much as possible with our teaching and research activities and, of course, clinical care. The fall 2020 still presents more uncertainty ahead, but there are some things that we do know about, and that's what we'll focus on now. We do know now that most classes this fall will likely be delivered remotely. There will be some in-person exceptions to that when possible. And those are going to be exceptions for things like laboratory teaching, simulation, uh, clinical placements, things that cannot take place remotely. We do understand and appreciate the challenges that this may pose for instructors and learners but we want you to know that there is support there and that we will deliver high quality programs without a doubt. There is a number of resources available. There's the Center for Teaching and Learning to help um, deliver these courses remotely. There's our Med IT services. And I wanna say a special thank you to Dr. Lynn Sonnenberg and the academic technology team who just stepped up and really helped um, assist those in transitioning their courses uh, to deliver them remotely and have some very exciting things planned for remote delivery in the near future as well. We've actually conducted a survey of instructors to better understand what the needs are of the various individuals who are teaching remotely so that we can actually um, identify and, and meet those challenges that you may be facing and form a community of practice. I think we've learned a lot through this uh, pandemic course and virtual things such as this session that we're having right now, maybe a, a new way of doing things in the future and things like uh, remote delivery of uh, programs are going to be a new way of doing things where we can engage students more broadly, not just in the province but internationally as well. So a new way of doing things and a new way of, of teaching uh, and training. As I mentioned before, the Association of Faculties of Medicine has provided a lot of guidance for the coming year as we continue to work together through the pandemic. And at the top of their list is the guiding principles to both medical education and research, and that's safety. Again, any decisions that are being made or that will be made as safety first and foremost. And as we move ahead, um, there's some more decisions that have been made recently, and I just wanna share another one of those with you. And that is the match with respect to the MD class, the medical class of 2021. Uh, the medical schools across Canada have agreed to actually conduct those medical schools in interviews virtually. And I'm very proud to say that the U of A will be leading the way nationally on that front, having already executed our medical mini interviews in March 2020 virtually with great success and literally within a matter of 72 hours. So again, it just shows you the great strength that's there when a group just pulls together and collaborates um, an amazing group of people that I'm so proud of. 
So that's a little bit about the pandemic and what we've been going through these past three months. I want to transition now to talk a little bit about um, the leadership transition that's taking place here at the University of Alberta and speak to you about the new president-elect, uh, Bill Flanagan, who officially begins on July 1, but who in fact began the day that his appointment was announced on March the 18th. In fact, his appointment was announced on March 18th, and by March 19th, he'd reached out and spoken to all the deans um, across the institution. He's hit the ground running, and he hasn't stopped since then. As many of you know, um, he is Edmonton born, a former lawyer, uh, coming to us from Queen's University. He really understands the importance of the University of Alberta to the province, to the country, and to the world. He's coming with his eyes wide open and he's fully aware of the financial and related challenges that we are facing. I think it's important to note that his track record at Queen's was built on being creative to find new sources of funding to build the law school. He's innovative and an entrepreneurial thinker and he sees the potential uh, in precision health and AI, for example. I've had um, a few meetings with him and in the opportunity to meet with President-elect Flanagan last week again, and we had the opportunity to discuss the many strengths within our faculty and um, some of the research direction and focus that we're taking, and he was fully supportive of that as well. In fact, Dr. Flan uh, President-elect Flanagan was also able to attend our faculty council uh, last week, again, demonstrating his great interest uh, in our faculty. His enthusiasm is palpable. I'm really excited about the opportunity to work with him in, in the years ahead. And together, we'll continue to build on the U of A strength and work to deliver responsive medical education, research, and care. I want to talk a little bit now about how we're going to carry out a balanced budget. As you're all aware, the University of Alberta is dealing with unprecedented pressures due to both the impact of COVID-19 and the major budgetary reductions. As you'll know, the provincial government passed its 2020 budget uh, in the fall, confirming the changes and reductions to post-secondary funding, including a reduction in allocation of what we call our Campus Alberta grant to the University of Alberta by amount of $110 million. In addition, we're being required to carry out a balanced budget but importantly, and this is what we need to emphasize, is that we will maintain high quality education and research. That's our priority. So I'm gonna be perfectly honest. It's gonna be a challenge, but these are the challenges that we meet and that we need to, to take on in order to be sustainable. We're gonna to have to make some difficult decisions. We're gonna to have to make some tough decisions, but we'll do them together. And I want to reassure you that everyone in our faculty will be part of finding the best solutions. We'll work together as partners in developing uh, in implementing these changes in the strategic plan that we'll be developing. And I'll tell you a bit about that as well. I want to start off, though, by telling you a little bit about um, the institutional budget strategy. I think some of you may have been present yesterday at GFC when uh, President-elect Flanagan was able to present his vision for the university. And he defines it, he's described it as the University of Alberta for Tomorrow, or UAT. And in fact, if you Google that, you'll find a website um, that provides additional information about what the University of Alberta for Tomorrow is, uh, the plans, the timelines. So it's going to be a great source of information. So I'd encourage you uh, to go to that site and find out more about uh, our president-elect's vision for, for the university. He's also having a town hall next week that you can sign up for, and you'll hear additional details there. But as, he, as President-elect Flanagan indicated yesterday, these are unprecedented challenges. But he also emphasized specifically that if we act quickly, we can actually turn our challenges into strategic transformation. And that's the way that he views this. We've got a burning platform. We can make changes. We'll need to make changes. But we'll come out better after this is through. So his vision is actually uh, a two-phased one. And that's the same approach that we're taking here in the faculty. So his vision 2022 speaks to the changes that will be taking place in terms of uh, potential academic restructuring through an academic restructuring working group that he has struck. And then changes as well to administrative restructuring and looking at service 
excellence transformation. So looking at the way that administrative and related services are being delivered and how we can do that more efficiently and effectively in using data. And I want to emphasize again that all of this is based on data. So the collection of data through things such as uniform and benchmarking against others to say these are areas that we can focus on and, and do better and using an external consultant group called the NOS Group. So this is an international group that's got expertise in post-secondary uh, institutions. So that's the two-phased approach that the institution is taking. And again, you'll see more on the website and you'll hear more from the president about that. Here in the faculty, we're also taking a two-step and two-phased approach to balancing our budget. The first thing that we did is we struck uh, what we call a faculty budget working group. This has been assembled with representation from senior leadership, department chairs, the School of Dentistry, our research institutes, and the research and education portfolios. The working group has been meeting weekly, in fact, to identify short-term pressures and goals of preserving excellence in education, research, and clinical care, and we are seeking input more broadly. We have consulted, the NOUS group is working with us, again, using the uniform data and data that we have here within the faculty to make um, evidence-based and informed decisions. So you'll hear more about that in the, uh, in the weeks ahead. The other thing that we're doing is um, we're, we're doing a strategic plan to look more longer in the longer term. So more for the, the two to three year to f even five year roadmap to say, um, where are we going? Where is the Faculty of Medicine going to be in 2025? Taking a look at where we are now, where our strengths are and where we need to really focus and continue to move ahead. In particular, taking into account our current economic situation. So the way that we're doing this, uh, this is going to be a phased approach. I hope to actually start in May, but have been delayed again because of the pandemic. But we'll be starting this approach in um, June 5th and 6th with a small working group, a two-day retreat, which again is going to be virtual, um, in keeping with the requirements of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. So we're going to be meet, meeting and developing um, initial draft, a very straw dog of, of a strategic plan. And then the work will really begin in the month of June when we are going to, to engage broadly with faculty, students and staff to get your input to say, who are we? Who is the Faculty of Medicine? What are our strengths? Um, where are we going to go and where are we going to be by 2025? So that will be the engagement that will take place in June and July. We'll get back to the working group uh, late in the summer, early in the fall, but I really want to have a strategic plan that's together that's going to lead us through uh, this next phase that's going to align with the plan of the university overall and with our province and country uh, in alignment with that as well. So really aiming to have that plan completed by, by later this fall. So I'm going to stop there. Again, the purpose was for me to, to reach out, um, to have a conversation with you. I, I wish it would be in, in person, and, and I'm hopeful that one day we will be able to meet in person again. But this is the opportunity for dialogue, for me to be able to answer questions uh, that you may have. Um, and I'm always open to, to hearing and receiving feedback. Um, so if you're not able to ask the questions today, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I can come to various meetings in various formats. Um, again, in the requirements and virtual meetings are, are being, um, being more the norm these days as well. So I'm going to stop there and um, look forward to the questions and conversation that, um, that we can have. So Daryl has been keeping track of the question um, and is going to be sending them to me. So the first question that comes up, it says, will there be a gender lens applied to the budget with recognition of the gender pay gap and the lack of family friendly policy and supports regarding childcare, um, acknowledgement of career gaps, increased work in the home, um, et cetera? That's a, a really important question. Uh, the university actually addressed this with the gender pay equity for professors. And some of the gender data are actually collected at FEC as well. Um, what we found is that the data showed no difference in merit at the assistant and associate professor level. Uh, during maternity leaves, merit increments are still awarded as a 1.0. Um, aggregate data were reviewed by our assistant dean of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And that's a very important position, and we're always taking that gender and equity lens on everything that we do. Uh, Pre-COVID, we discussed exploring this further and continuing some of the research and salary differences between men and women that started a couple of years ago. And I think that's important work 
that um, we will need to continue as well. So thank you for that question. The next question says, can you comment um, on the press talking about joining faculties? And if so, which faculties? So that's a very interesting question as well. Um, and I think if, if you go to the to the website, the University of Alberta for tomorrow, and based on um, President-elect Flanagan's presentation that he had yesterday, and that he also presented to the board, there is discussion about um, academic restructuring, but the work is still very early in that regard. They've just begun to struck the working group and, are, and again are working with the external consultants to see um, what, what um, the best structure would be at the University of Alberta. So in fact, we, we don't know things about numbers or um, if faculties will be joined or what that actually looks like. Um, but no, and, and again, this is something that um, the president-elect emphasized yesterday that there will be broad consultation as well. One thing that was mentioned is that um, for a university of this size, there's 18 faculties, and that's a larger number than what we see um, at other comparable faculties, not just in Canada, but um, nationally and internationally as well. So I think it's an important area of consideration, but one that will be, um, be looked at in great uh, depth and detail. I'm very pleased to say that um, on the Academic Restructuring Working Group, Dr. David Eisenstadt is representing departments of chairs in that in that vein. So very pleased to have him as a member of that working group. And you'll be hearing more from that working group and about that working group as well in ongoing communications. The next question says, I have questions about the function of the Health Research Ethics Board. Um, to, to go with the earlier question, is there any interest in having one HREB for the province, at least for studies that are undertaken at two or more sites in Alberta? I'll be honest, I don't know the details about this. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Ruscha in the clinical research area um, and Dr. Clark at, at the BPRI's office has had discussions about this in terms of um, single ethics boards. And I know that there have been discussions actually over the years. I also know that Dr. Ruscha is having a town hall on Thursday talking about um, research uh, relaunch as it relates to clinical research activities in particular. So I suggest it might be a good opportunity to reach out to him either at that town hall or, or by emailing him directly. We all do see the potential efficiencies of having a, a single um, ethics board for the province if that was feasible and impossible to obtain. The next question says, I'm the administrative team lead for undergrad surgery and I'm a member of the GFC representing NASA and I also sit on the GFC APC. I've heard President-elect Flanagan speak a few times about increasing GFC's productivity by taking away administrative duties from them and having them do more teaching and research up to 25%. What kind of impact do you think that will have in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry with so many GFCs that also have significant administrative roles? So I've also heard um, this comment from, from President-elect Flanagan, um, and not just here at the University of Alberta, but other institutions looking similarly and saying, what are the jobs that we are doing? What are our academics doing? Are they doing administrative roles? Are they spending time teaching? Are they spending time doing research? And what is the most effective use of their time? I think we'll all agree, agree that all three of those roles are important to varying degrees and depending upon what the roles are. And um, every institution needs um, a combination of teaching, research, uh, and administration. So we will be looking at that at the, at the faculty level as well. I know that they're looking at that at the institutional level to say what is the right mix in terms of administrative roles. And um, with our external consultant group, the NOS group, we're also looking at that here within the faculty. We want to be sure that we are meeting the needs of the faculty through the various administrative roles um, and that we're actually able to support the education and the research activities that are taking place. So we need to be sure that we have the right mix. And so that's why taking a careful look at what that might right mix might be is so important at this time in particular. The next question says, um, can you please let us know how you see the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry continue to provide summer school of international students or opportunities for international faculty development? That's a really good question and it's one that comes up um, almost at every one of our dean's calls 
um, and also at our, uh, our national meetings that we have with uh, deans across the country, is how are we going to be able to continue to support uh, the international trainees and in international faculty development? There's still a lot that's unknown in that area, so I'm not going to be able to answer specifically. We're looking at opportunities, though, for um, remote delivery of some uh, potential programs and some, some coursework. I think some of you have heard me say already that, um, in fact, Queen's University just last week announced a Bachelor of Health Sciences program, a four-year program that's going to be entirely delivered uh, remotely online. So that could be an opportunity for, for international students. We've been looking very closely here as we develop our international program and international relationships to see what sorts of offerings we can, can provide here. Things are going to be different. We're not going to have the same sort of travel. Um, I think all of us are thinking the same thing, that maybe not being able to travel isn't such a bad thing. We're actually able to, to stay in our in our offices and do work remotely. But it does have some in, in, uh, results in some barriers and impediments to, to moving forward. And, and one of them relates to bringing international trainees here and international students in our, in our many programs. So we're going to have to look at, at how we can get around some of those challenges and remote delivery is one potential way. There's another question now. It says, with the gradual opening up of various places and economy, will the medical students be able to have opportunities to have clinical shadowing to improve on their physical examination clinical skills? So again, we've been looking very closely, and I know Dr. Amaya Lang and Shirley Shipper in particular and all their leadership team have been looking at what are the optimal ways uh, with which we can provide training and learning opportunities for our, for our trainees, but first and foremost, ensuring the safety of those educational um, activities. Lots of discussions about um, clinical clerkships and getting them back into clinical sites and and aiming for that to start um, in June, early June. And looking at things like initially having um, block weeks where we can do online and simulation type sessions before we get them back out into the clinical settings. So to answer the question about shadowing, I think the most important thing is, first of all, we have to get um, our medical students, our more senior students back into the various rotations and ensure that their training needs are met. And then we'll look at um, the other types of, of opportunities that are there. But know that you've got a very strong leadership team in the education um, area that are looking at all aspects of this, um, from UME to PGME um, to all the educational portfolios not just in medicine, but dentistry has spent a considerable amount of time to say, how can we deliver our dental program? How can we continue to support our trainees and modify our training program to meet the requirements of our trainees, um, especially in things like simulation? You know, Dr. Major and Dr. Compton and, and others have put a huge amount of time in modifying uh, the simulation activities for their trainees to ensure that they're actually to get those simulation courses in, meet all the requirements, modify the way that it's being delivered. Simple things, um, not just simple, these simple things actually become quite complicated when you have to implement them. Things like keeping a daily log of, of who's in the courses, in the classrooms, um, doing symptom checks, ensuring that there's cleaning supplies available. So what used to be a simple activity of just walking into a sim lab and, um, and starting your work is now taking on a whole new complexity. So there's been a lot of work in the background to ensure that uh, these activities, to ensure the training needs are met and that um, the trainees can continue in their programs. I'm going to look at the next question here. Um, one thing I wondered in faculty council was whether or not there possibly be some differences between different institutions in how data were collected and reported. I'm basically wondering whether we at the University of Alberta might somehow have reported our data in a manner that made us come out as looking the most costly, where we were more honest than other institutions did, others used some way of hiding costs to not appear so costly. I'm just asking in case how the data up here has adversely affected our funding, how the institution is viewed. You raise a very good point, and that goes back to um, the accuracy of the data and the importance, again, of evidence and making um, evidence-informed decisions based on the data that is available. 
Um, ideally, we would have had several years of the uniform data with which to guide um, our decisions. We're getting another year of data right now, and so we will have um, several years of data very soon. But with respect to the costing, the costing data was um, taken from, from Central, and I understand from, from other sources with respect to, um, to budgetary sources. So the reporting of those would be, would be accurate with respect to budgets. I mean, there always are um, potential discrepancies in how things are coded and defined. And so to the best of, of our ability, we aim to provide accurate information. But again, as we get into um, ongoing years of data collection, we'll be able to see that more accurately. And that's one thing that I've learned and learned in particular over these past few months is just the importance, again, of being flexible um, and, and being able to, um, to make some decisions, but also being able to, to change some decisions that have been made. So know as we're moving forward that there will be decisions that are being made and we'll have to continue to evaluate them and ensure that they're best decisions for um, based on the de data that's available and, and as we move ahead. So again, the data is important um, and the, the accuracy of the data and the importance of making um, evidence-based informed decisions. There's a question that says, is there a plan for supporting the thesis-based graduate students who spend most of their time completing lab work? Will these defense requirements change post-pandemic uh, within the faculty? Again, another really good question, I think. Again, there, there is some silver lining in this pandemic, and that's just forced us to take a look at the way that we do things and have been doing things differently. Before, we used to think that the only way to do a defense was to bring everybody into a room together. Um, and then there were some times where we maybe um, bring one person in virtually and the phone line would, would not work properly. I think we've really perfected to a much greater extent our, our abilities to conduct things virtually. And again, the conversion of the MD admissions, the, the mini interviews within a matter of three days from in-person to a, a remote format delivery and having it done uh, so successfully is a really good example of that. So your question about defense requirements changing post-pandemic, will there be changes? I, I can't answer that specifically, but I all that to say that um, we're looking at, at ways of, of making things more efficient um, and ensuring that um, best practices are followed and that the, the needs of our trainings and educational programs are being met. Question now that says, in regard to clinical research moving forward, is there any update on purchase of the research module for Connect Care? This could really help specific clinical research areas in precision health. So a good question about, about clinical research and connect care and the research module. I won't be able to answer that one specifically. Um, and again, that's going to be a good one for Dr. Riche in the town hall on Thursday, if you're able to attend that. I do know that they're looking um, into that in particular in order to, um, to really enhance the efficiency of the, of the research activities in, in the clinical research that's being done. I don't know the specific answer to that, so we'll direct you to, to Dr. Riche to, to answer that. I'm very excited about using Connect Care. I actually, um, as you know, I'm a practicing physician, I'm a nephrologist, and when I moved up from Calgary, we don't have Connect Care in Calgary. And I'm, for the first six months, I don't have clinical duties, but this summer I'm actually starting some clinical rotations on the consult service and had the opportunity to do my Connect Care training um, in April. Initially, it was supposed to be in-person training, but with the pandemic, they actually transitioned it to remote and online. So I was able to, again, to do all my Connect Care training uh, remotely online. So I'm now um, an official Connect Care trainee who's um, passed their exam and looking forward to doing clinical training this summer in clinical care. So looking forward to using Connect Care and the research module in the future. There's a question now that says, I wonder if postgraduate training positions offered for IMGs would be affected by the current financial challenges for 2021 cycle. Now, so this question relates to postgraduate training for IMGs. And that is something that um, there's been some initial discussions again um, at the national level, because it's important again that 
um, the faculties of medicine are consistent or aligned as much as possible in uh, such sorts of decisions because it doesn't just affect one institution, not just the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry here at the University of Alberta, but it affects um, other faculties across the country. So there have been some discussions about IMGs, but um, to my knowledge at this point, uh, no specific um, decisions made, ongoing discussions about that for the future. The next question is, given the importance of providing a team approach in healthcare delivery, what ideas are there for interdisciplinary education and experience now that the Health Science Council is being discontinued. So interdisciplinary education uh, is so important. I think many of you know that uh, my initial training was, was in nursing and I really see the value of interdisciplinary training. It isn't just after you complete all your training and, and start um, practicing in your various areas that you suddenly somehow um, appreciate and, and know the best way to work in an interdisciplinary setting. That's something that actually has to take place um, early and early on in the training programs. And I've been so impressed with the interdisciplinary programs that have been available here um, in medicine and in dentistry, um, in the MLS program, radiation therapy, all the programs have, have embedded this within their base programs. So this is going to be something that is going to be important to continue uh, going forward. Um, with respect to it being delivered through the Health Sciences Council, I'm not sure what that will look like. There are still discussions taking place there. It looks like it's going to transition more to the, the various faculties. But again, this is a time where we'll have to look at how things are being delivered. But I think the thing we need to emphasize is that interdisciplinary training is important and we are somehow going to have to ensure that it's embedded. We've actually spoken to all the programs to ensure that it continues um, and is able to continue uh, in the upcoming year and in the fall in particular moving ahead. The next question says, uh, telehealth may be here to stay that must present unique challenges. Is the curriculum being modified to adapt to the challenges of telehealth? That is a very good question. Um, and I just want to start off by saying that, um, that telehealth and um, delivering courses remotely is an excellent way actually to provide education, to reach a broad range of, of individuals. There's so many different formats that it can be done, synchronous and asynchronous. Um, there's a lot of individuals with great expertise to help with that. Again, the Center of Teaching and Learning um, Dr. Lynn Sonnenberg and her team in academic technologies. Uh, we've done a survey of individuals to see what their needs are. So there are challenges, but we're also looking for ways to support those challenges and to support our instructors, looking at um, through uh, the faculty development office in particular in Dr. Kudimoto's portfolio, how can we develop a community of practice um, in the next short while based on the survey responses that we got to ensure that we meet the needs of the instructors that can provide them with the tools going forward. Not just for teaching, but um, you know, telehealth is gonna be a new way of providing care. And I see that on Friday, um, the Department of Medicine is their grand rounds is talking about, um, I think it's called training in virtual healthcare and virtual healthcare. So I think that's gonna be a really good um, opportunity. So as we're delivering more care virtually, and what we used to do in terms of having patients come in and uh, do a face-to-face -face visit now is being done virtually. So how do you incorporate a trainee into that and how do you ensure that those needs are being met? So some, I'm sure we're going to hear some really innovative things from, from the presenters on um, Friday morning at the Department of Medicine Grand Round. So I look forward to that. There's so much that we can learn and so much that we can develop in this area. It's, a, it's the way of the future um, without a doubt. The next question says, I understand that budget cuts mean job cuts. What do you anticipate layoffs look like and when do we expect to see this hit our faculty? That's a very good question and it's a, a very difficult question um, and a very difficult time. We do know that um, a large portion of, of the budget at the, at the institutional level and at the faculty level um, is for salaries, um, salaries of faculty and of support staff. We do know that there have been um, approximately 
think it's about 400 to 500 or maybe a bit more positions affected um, to date and they anticipate probably about another 400. Uh, President Mike Flanagan indicated approximately 1,000 positions overall and I think that was the number that he presented yesterday at GFC. What that might look like, we're still, we're still looking at that um, and, and what to anticipate. What we're looking at in particular is um, things like, um, you know, retirements, um, layoffs, positions that um, through attrition, um, positions that we might not fill again. Those are the first ones that, that we would look at. Um, and, and in particular, things like like retirements and, and not filling some positions that are empty. So that, that's what we look at in the initial phases. So there will be more. You'll hear more about that um, in, in the weeks um, coming ahead and, and as we see more of the data and information available. The next question says, how did the University of Alberta do on the 2020 CARMS match? How are the unmatched students, in any, if any, being accommodated for success next year? Um, a really good question. Um, and there's been so many numbers going on in my head. I've, I've had budgets um, every day, I think. And so I know that we did really well um, on the first round of the match. And on the second round, if I remember correctly, I think there were just two or three. And they were really looking at those um, closely in terms of what to do. I'm going to hand that over to Dr. Maya Lang because she knows all the details and it's been uh, right on top of that. I want to make sure that we get the right information. Maya, go ahead. Hi there, thank you for the question. Uh, I'll answer it in two parts. From a PGME perspective, all of our positions were filled, so that's a great success to our programs. In terms of our residents, um, we had five students who were unmatched, uh, and that's kind of in keeping with what our numbers have been like over the past several years, and all of them are being supported by the UME and by the OAW team. And I would say that from, from my understanding is the reasons for being unmatched were the students were seeking some very, very competitive uh, positions and they're being supported with uh, looking for uh, other forms of education to support their career goals. So we're very fortunate to have a, a big team to help support these individuals. Thank you, Maya. The next question is about thesis-based graduate students. And they say, will thesis-based graduate students have to stay longer in their program before graduating since there's been an interruption in this academic year? Or would they be allowed to build their thesis on less material than initially planned? This is particularly important for international students that may have to pay tuition for extra semesters spent in their program. Again, a very important question and one that's being looked at um, very closely. I've been very impressed with um, Dr. Melissa Padfield in the registrar's office and the careful attention that she's being, um, and, and Dr. Brooke Milne as well in um, FGSR. They're looking very closely at issues such as this. And first and foremost, what we want to do is ensure that these interruptions that have taken place um, at undergraduate and graduate and, and at all levels actually do not result in a delay in, um, in graduation. It may be a bit more difficult in students who completed their coursework and are in their thesis-based areas. And so this is where we really need you to reach out to your supervisors and your supervisory committees or to Dr. Hannah Ostergaard, who's our Associate Dean of Graduate Studies, if you're worried in any way that there might be potential delays. We want to the best of our abilities um, to identify ways that there aren't delays and that we can ensure that our trainees are getting the highest quality education that they that they need and that they, they may be able to meet their educational goals in a, in a timely fashion. So please do reach out. Um, Dr. Hannah Ostergaard is, um, is very dedicated and um, available. So if there's any concerns that you may have at all, I really encourage you to, to reach out to, to her and to your supervisors and committee members as well to have those sorts of discussions. Next question says, universities that have branch writers available often do better in multi-sector large grants. Is there a possibility of the University of Alberta having such people available to raise our success rate for large group grants? 
this has been an area that I've heard about as well. Um, and in looking at um, strategic plan that Dr. Chris Powers and his team put together last uh, year, um, the interim strategic plan for research, uh, there was a focus on large team grants, and that really is a focus of other institutes as well. And so I, I know that Power and his team are looking at ways that they can support um, the implementation of uh, such team grants. Um, and these are parts, parts of the things that we will be developing and focusing on further as we um, start looking at our strategic plan and rolling out our strategic plan. So we look forward to your input um, in that regard and in particular as to uh, the benefit that you may think this may have in increasing success in large team grants. I know another important thing for success in grants is just the importance of um, internal peer review. And I'd strongly encourage all of you as you're writing your grants to get as much um, peer review that you can, whether it's from colleagues or friends or from an institution um, sharing grants with each other, because we do know that the grants that are most likely to be successful are not just those that are supported by things like uh, grant reviewers, but grant writers, but it's really the internal peer review that has really been shown to be effective. So as you're putting together your grants for CHR for the fall, I strongly encourage you to get um, that internal peer review. And that's where our research institutes can really play an important role in helping with that. The question next is, is how you'll be able to make fair decisions for budget balance for early career scientists who made many efforts and give products if you cannot directly communicate with them. Being a minority in a, in a competition with senior scientists can cause wrong information and communication. Yeah, it's, um, again, it speaks to the importance of um, equity, diversity, and inclusivity, and, and being able to communicate um, freely and, and to those uh, and openly. And, and I hope that's an environment and a culture that um, we have here at the university. I know it's, it's something that's um, extremely important uh, to me. And that's why we have the Office of EDI as well as other resources and people uh, to reach out to. We need to make sure that um, our early career scientists do have the support uh, that they need, um, especially during this period of time. I actually have a um, virtual town hall. I'm hoping that it's scheduled for next week. Um, we were trying to set it up for myself to meet with all the early career um, investigators to just reach out to them. And um, I, I know it's been a particularly difficult time for them as um, some of them have not been able to do some of the experience of the experiments that they wish to for the fall. So really wanna reach out to them um, and understand how we can better support them going forward. But um, don't hesitate to reach out and know that um, I'm reaching out to you as well. Um, the next question says, has the university been awarded any funds, example for international student fees from the province, in response to the data that were collected about the potential impact on grad, graduate students? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I wonder, my, do you, would you be able to answer that question? I'm afraid I don't, um, and I wonder if this person perhaps could uh, reach out to me afterwards and we can have a conversation so I can understand the question better and get uh, details to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, there have been some federal funds that have been announced um, for, for students um, as well as for research investigators with respect to Federal funds are announced last week for research investigators. We're still awaiting further details about those. So um, many of these announcements came out very quickly, as you know, and um, in our discussions at various meetings um, have sometimes not had a lot of detail. And so there takes a, a time and to develop the processes around them to ensure that um, the funds are administered um, fairly and to those of, of greatest need. And so that might be the case with some of these as well. The next question says, when will third and fourth year MD clerkships restart? Will this result in a double cohort in the fall? And will this cause a preceptor shortage? I, that might be a good one. Specific. 
So the um, we're very pleased that the fourth year students um, have completed all their necessary requirements for graduation. The third year students uh, will be starting clerkship in virtual format June 1st, and that will include and progress to direct patient uh, experiences June 22nd. The uh, uh, whole MD program has done a marvelous job at really finding a system to minimize the impact of a double cohort. There will be a short time of overlap with the incoming third year students, um, but uh, we are not expecting actually a preceptor shortage. Uh, there, it's been an excellent um, schedule designed to optimize safety and learning for the, the students and experiences for the preceptors. Thank you, Baya. The next question says, will the university be considering lowering tuition fees since classes are being held online? So this is a question that has come up not just here at University of Alberta, but I know it's come up at, at all institutions across the country. Um, and, and again, I want to emphasize that programs that are being delivered online are going to be just as high quality um, as the ones in person. They might be in a different format, but we, we're going to ensure that the, the students receive the type of, of education that they that they need in order to meet their training requirements. So in fact, um, the tuition fees will remain the same um, at this point in time. So it looks like we have no additional live questions at this point in time. I'll just See if Daryl's typing furiously over there. Give me the thumbs up. Oops, just wait. So if there are no further live questions, we'd really appreciate your feedback um, on this format because it's a format that we can really easily set up um, to a broad group, to a smaller group, um, it's important, and especially as we start developing our strategic plan, that we um, get your input. I don't want you to ever feel that you can't communicate um, with me as the dean. One of the important things, um, one of the reasons I took this job was to be able to, to meet with people um, and to communicate. It's, um, dean for the people was my motto, and I want to be I want to be there. So know that um, the, the early investigators were reaching out to you, but if any other groups um, are are interested in meeting, just reach out to the Dean's office and we can arrange that. We'll look for feedback as to this format, as to how um, successful or how we can do things differently in the future. And we will be doing more virtual things of this nature because we do um, really appreciate and, and value your feedback and, and want to involve and engage you in these conversations as we go forward. So thank you again for all that you've done these past months um, and your support. Um, of the institutions. I've been so impressed and so proud of how the faculty has pulled together um, over these past months and I'm sure will in the months and years ahead and I'm really looking forward to working with you all and to meeting and meeting you all either virtually or, or individually in whatever format uh, that may mean. And I just want to say uh, a huge congratulations to all of our graduates who are going to be convocating um, in the month in, in the month of June. It's a very special time and know that um, here at the faculty as well as in, at the institution, we're looking at special ways to recognize you during this, this milestone. So we're thinking of you and we're all very proud of your achievements, especially considering um, what we've had to go through for these past few months. We know that you're going to do the faculty proud and you'll be great professionals in all your chosen careers. So thank you, everyone, um, and I look forward to your feedback um, and look forward to joining up with you again in the very near future. Have a good day.